Hi, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the, to the webinar about threat modeling. Um, I hope you guys can hear me correctly. If not, please report so in the, in the chat. So let's, uh, let's get started. Yes, threat modeling is um, it's a very interesting and easy way to get insight and to, uh, to get insight on what's actually what the entire attack surface of a system looks like and how it can be attacked and which threats are actually applicable to it. So that's what we're gonna, gonna talk about uh, today. What I would like to talk about first is a brief introduction. Who am I? Uh, what's going on in real life? And how can uh, threat modeling help us? Then we're briefly going to analyze a recent data breach just to make sure that we can uh, we can learn from this because it is really important nowadays that instead of um, yeah just doing our own security research that you actually also learn from what is happening in real life to make sure that we can prevent these data breaches. Then threat modeling itself, the subject that we are all here for today. <laughs> um, then some some tips to get started in real life, and a conclusion, and hopefully still some time left for uh, for questions. All right, so let me quickly start. My name is Roy Deisters. I am a principal security consultant at, uh, at Secura. Um, I've been doing that for the last, well, seven or eight years now, and I'm mainly focused on the subjects of red teaming, infrastructure assignments, assessments, uh, ICS SCADA, and nowadays also a lot of threat modeling. What I really like to do in, my, in the security assessments that I do, instead of just looking at a a uh, single aspect of a system, I really like to look at the, the global perspective. And I like to do that with, with both red teaming and <laughs> threat modeling, because often you see that nowadays, a lot of systems are actually reliant on each other. They're all dependent on each other. So the question is, how well do all of these interconnected systems and all of these security measures that we have implemented over the years, how well do they really hold up uh, to, well, to an adversary? that uh, wants to obtain access or wants to ab abuse our system. So Secura, formerly named Medicine Gurkha. Um, we do a lot of security assessments. That's the team where I, where I work for. We also do a lot of uh, security audits, uh, advisory certifications, and nowadays also development of, of uh, security products. So this image is not a pretty image. Um, I assume that you guys probably has, have seen this before. This is an image that visualizes the data breaches that have happened over the recent years. As you can see, well, there's a big, big red uh, circle in the middle. Um, the darker the color is, it indicates um, the, well, pretty much the confidentiality of the information that has been breached. So for example, at the Marriott hotels, um, credit card numbers were breached over there. Uh, you also see, well, recently in the latest years, MongoDB, you can see that a lot of information, it's a really big circle. So a lot of information has been leaked by public MongoDB databases and things like that. Uh, in the bottom, you still see the LinkedIn hack where 117 million usernames and passwords of, of people were, were leaked. So this is not a pretty picture. We're not doing, we're not doing good, actually. So, this one, as I mentioned, the LinkedIn data, data leak that has happened, a lot of usernames and passwords were, uh, were obtained. However, nowadays, just last month at a, a company called Suprema, a security company actually, um, a lot of biometric information was leaked as well. So instead of just a username and a password, which you can change, uh, in this case, also biometric information was leaked. Like for example, fingerprints, facial rec recognition, things, and uh, things like uh, things like that. Um, yeah. So um, in comparison with just usernames and passwords, it is not free, very feasible to actually change your uh, well your fingerprints or your yeah the way that your your face uh, looks like. So the the impact of these data breaches is actually changing. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> apologies. Let me quickly head back. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So this was actually the picture that I was I was talking about. My apologies. There was a slight delay in my uh, in in my presentation there. So this was the Suprema data leak that I was talking about. Um, yes. Let me quickly quickly continue. Also, 
um, it is really important. Uh, some time ago, also at Facebook, a lot of information leaked. This was actually not a direct leak of, of Facebook, but however, <laughs> this information has been leaked by a third party. However, it is still information coming from, from Facebook and obtained through, uh, through that. This was actually leaked through, uh, to an application called Cultura Colectiva, a Mexican company that had this information available online publicly in a, uh, well, in a, uh, a street bucket on Amazon. So how can, how can we actually prevent these, uh, these data breaches? Like I mentioned before, it is really important to, um, to analyze what we can learn from these data breaches just to make sure that we can uh, prevent these things from, from happening, right? So we're briefly going to look at the, the data breach that has happened at Equifax, uh, 40, 147 million uh, personally identifiable information records were stolen there, were obtained there by an, uh, by an adversary. Um, names, addresses, dates of birth, social security numbers, all of that information was, uh, was leaked. Uh, and that actually, that that uh, vulnerability actually took place to uh, because of a uh, vulnerable Apache Strut server. So that was a known vulnerability that I knew that I had, but possibly for business reasons, I decided not to patch the system at this at that point. Yeah, and in in, in terms of impact, it, there were 147 million records. Well, records of people were were obtained there. And in times of financial impact, uh, Equifax over the, the coming times has actually settled to pay over about 700 million US dollars in fines and settlements after this data breach. So this is really, really serious. So just to start looking at what this environment actually looks like or looked like that got compromised. Very briefly, like on an, on an overview, the environment kind of looks like, look like uh, this. On the one hand, on the left, and I hope you can see my, my mouse. You can see the customers as an external entity. They were external to Equifax, this makes sense. Um, they were communicating with an internal application, well, an, a, well, a publicly facing application, which is a automated consumer interview system, ASICS, it was called. It was a web application that was actually running on this vulnerable Apache Struts system that I was talking about. And the system actually obtained information from a database in the in the back end. So this is pre still a pretty much standard setup, uh, nothing really serious, well, really different going on here, right? So let's have a look about how things actually went wrong. Okay, so <clears throat> this briefly showcases um, what vulnerabilities were actually changed to result in this data breach. So like I mentioned, First off, number one over here, we had the vulnerable Apache system that had a known vulnerability, so it was easy to hack in this, into the system with a uh, publicly available exploit. Um, second off, that's network monitoring, but the, this network monitoring should have, yeah, should have detected this attack, right? Or should have, well, 147 million records, well, records of people were actually stolen there. It should have noticed something. At this point, Sadly, because of a, an expired certificate, this network monitoring was actually not active at that time. So it was monitoring, but it didn't send any information out. Number three was actually, um, first off, when this, this first system was compromised, the attacker was looking into how to elevate their privileges, right? Because this ASICS uh, customer portal did not have all of this information. However, upon analysis of this system, it turned out that the system actually, for bootstrapping purposes, to make sure it could uh, connect to backend databases like its legitimate ASICS database, uh, was using a configuration share. This configuration share was actually in the data center zone, but besides just the information of its database that it should reach, it could also reach configuration scripts and configuration files of other systems. So that actually allowed it to, uh, the, the attacker to obtain this information and to obtain credentials that could be used again to access other databases. That's actually number four, 48 other databases were accessed. 
So on these 48 databases, the attacker simply was looking around, doing some queries to just to find out what kind of information was actually in these databases, just to make sure, well, just to find whether this information can be of value to the attacker. Well, once information was found, this information was copied back into the customer portal. It was just put on a public, uh, on a public directory accessible to the internet, and it was downloaded by the attacker afterwards. So to quickly summarize, um, you have the customers on the one hand side, external entities. We have these things called processes in the threat modeling methodology. We have data stores on the other hand, and we have these lines, which are data connections, and these red dotted lines over here, those are trust boundaries. Those are, uh, those are boundaries where actually information or data connections traverse between, well, uh, trusted zones and zones that are not as trusted. Like, for example, the data center zone or other zones are usually considered to be much more trusted than a DMZ zone that contains a publicly accessible website or the internet, for example. And what I really like about, about threat modeling is that it, that it actually allows you to see all of these security dependencies that are actually in a system like this. Because if you would analyze this system, like in a previous slide, if you would analyze it without taking the security dependencies into account, you could perhaps find that this A6 customer portal was sufficiently secure, right? But maybe at a later point in time, well, when this vulnerability was found, it could be exploited, but it was just, it didn't have any other security dependence, so dependencies, so other systems were not directly dependent on the security of this customer portal, right? And what I really like about threat modeling is by uh, making a diagram that is as complete as possible, uh, that you can use that to analyze the entire attack surface of a portal like this to make sure that you can actually see whether a compromise, for example, of this portal can have an impact on other applications and other information as well. So I think that's a really valuable uh, addition that you can have w with uh, when you are using threat modeling instead of just looking at, uh, just analyzing a, uh, well, a part of the application itself. All right. So to quickly go on to threat modeling, I will briefly touch upon what you can actually, what threat modeling actually is and how you can use it. Well, threat modeling is a method to analyze the attack surface. First off, to analyze the attack surface of a new system, for example, when you are developing, developing, developing it or of a system that already exists, like, well, for example, I, existing ICS SCADA environments or environments like the environment that we just looked at for Equifax, things like, uh, things like that. And as the second stage, it allows you, after you've You've sort of you've mapped out the entire attack surface. It allows you to start thinking about the threats that are actually applicable to it, right? And you can do that based on this uh, data flow diagram that you have created in the previous step. So if you if you were to start thinking about the threats that were applicable to the to, for example, Equifax, you would have probably would have figured out if you had the entire attack surface mapped out and you were thinking about these threats, you probably would have figured out that it was not just this portal, but a lot of other systems were actually relying on this portal for its security because this portal was able to access a configuration file share that contains pretty much all the, the keys to the kingdom to all the other information, right? What I really like about it as well is it allows you to identify threats that are unique to the situation. These are not just um, like in the, in the Equifax case, these are not known uh, vulnerabilities that you can just take out of a book and just check off <laughs> and to see whether you are vulnerable to, to these or not. Because often it's the combination of different threats that can result in a large vulnerability. Often in information security, it can be one plus one can be 100 together. And well, like in the Equifax case, it can be one plus one plus one, like four <laughs> can be uh, 147 million together. Yes, and as the final step, it allows you to, to determine which countermeasures you should take and which mitigations. 
So once you start looking into threat modeling, for example, when you start searching for resource, resources about threat modeling online, you would often see a quote like this, think like an attacker. You would just have to think like, a, like an attacker and um, basically write down all the threats and all the risks that you can potentially abuse and basically you're done. But in real life, that is very, very hard because from our perspective is completely different than the perspective of a hacker, of a, for example, of a Chinese hacker that, that completely looks at your system in a different light. So what is really important during threat modeling is that you combine knowledge, that you, ha that you have a threat modeling session and that you have a diverse audience with people that have different viewpoints of your environment or application, just to make sure that you do not create sort of like a creative blindness. Like for example, if you've created a system all by yourself, you've designed it, you've done, you've done all, you've, you've done all the implementation steps. That means that you have a certain that it becomes very hard to take a step back and to look at to, at your environment or your system the way an attacker would do. So it is really important to combine knowledge, to have open brainstorm sessions, open discussions, and to have a diverse team in these, uh, yeah, during these these threat modeling sessions. So it is really important to know that threat modeling is not a um, not a method that you can just use by that is just used by one person. You cannot just like hire a threat modeling expert and let this person do all the threat modeling exercises for your uh, for all of your environments in your company. Uh, once in a while, slice a slice a pizza under the door and then just keep on going. It's really about combining knowledge, and it's also because systems are highly dynamic. And they are often changed. The attack landscape often also also changes. New vulnerabilities can pop up. It is not something that you just do once when a system is designed and when it is uh, when it is implemented first, and then just well leave it as is for the coming five years while the system is being changed, being updated. It is really important to keep up my, up updating the threat model as well. So what can you actually use it for? Well. Threat modeling, that's both its strength and its weakness uh, for, for, especially in the Stride method that is being, that is developed by Microsoft, it is quite abstract. So that means that you can use it to identify vulnerabilities in a lot of different things like web applications, APIs, network infrastructures, mobile applications, physical systems, um, but often in combination with attack trees, things like that, IoT devices, and et cetera. It also means that during threat modeling exercises, especially if you start using Stride, and I'll give some examples in the in uh, well in the coming coming time, that it can be a bit hard to uh, think about. For example, if you start thinking about spoofing, to think about which real life attacks an attacker could potentially do do on your system to spoof the identity of somebody else. So that's both an advantage and a, and a disadvantage of the usage of, of, of Stride. Um, but the advantages of, of, of threat modeling in a general perspective, I think a really important advantage is that, you, that it allows you to structurally find and mitigate threats before abuse takes place. And what I really like to do with the, to use it for as well in uh, the security assessments that I do for, for Secura, is that it allows you to understand and to validate security requirements that are placed on a, on a system. Often what you see in practice is that there are certain security requirements in place, like for example, yeah, the system must always use this TLS version, TLS 1.3, something like that with, this, with these cipher suites. But often, once you start talking with, uh, with developers or with uh, business owners or with uh, architects, it turns out that other aspects of security can be much more important. Like for example, well, in no way it, can, it should be possible that for example, a customer can see information belonging to another customer. All of that things, often these security requirements are more implicit, but I really like to use them, uh, well, to use threat modeling sessions and the team, the diversity in these sessions to validate and understand the security requirements and to perhaps extend upon the security requirements. Yes, and all of this is, of course, 
it is much easier and cheaper to actually implement a security fix uh, well when a system is still being designed then actually when it is in a already in a production environment and then it can be very hot and very costly yes and it's it's a re really allows you as well once you have your entire um, attack surface and all of your trust boundaries mapped in there you can use that to structurally uh, determine which security measures should be focused on first which security measures should have the priority because some threats for example if you have threats that can potentially be uh, be exploited from the internet well the chances that this will actually happen are much higher well i, ho I hope at least than, than threats that are uh, that are only coming from your internal network it doesn't mean that you should just ignore threats from uh, coming from your internal network but if you have to put priorities on your threats on which you should focus on first, uh, threat modeling really allows you to have a, a structured way to do that. So which steps should be performed? Um, this is actually a, a diagram from Microsoft TechNet um, for, uh, and it describes the, the way that Microsoft sees and the, the optimal way to perform threat modeling exercises. You start off with a diagram. That makes sense, right? I've already talked about that. <laughs> so you start off with a with a diagram to map out the connections and thus getting a complete overview of the attack surface. After that, this uh, you, you're going to have this threat modeling session where you, in, in combination with other people, start thinking about threats that are applicable to this environment. After that, of course, the mitigation step. The old threats that have been uh, identified well, there should be something there, right? You should mitigate it, or you should at least know that, uh, or, or you should have a founded way to accept these threats. So following the line, the validation step. The validation step is actually where uh, you would assess whether the, the threat has actually been successfully mitigated, and what's really important as well, to assess whether this uh, change does not introduce a new threat, because um, at Secure, we do a lot of reassessments of well, as well of security vulnerabilities that we have, that we have found before. And, it's, and sadly, sometimes um, fixes uh, in applications or environment can actually introduce new vulnerabilities that might even be, uh, might even be uh, more dangerous than the ones that were, were taken away. So it's really important to do this validation step as well. And of course, because you've changed your environment after um, after implementing these uh, these fixes, it is really important to update the threat modeling uh, diagrams as well. And so it's like a continuous process of improving your security. Yeah. So to to continue in the first first step, so creating a data flow diagram that would be the first step to start um, using threat modeling. Um, so, for example, if we were to create a data flow diagram of a mobile application, often it would be something like this, right? You would have a mobile application and it would request certain information from a web service that is uh, that you have developed and that is somewhere in your, for example, in your DMZ environment. These circles that are listed here, they are processes. Processes are entities that are under your, your own control, basically. Uh, the mobile application has been developed by the organization itself and the web service as well. So those are not external, they're processes. So um, continuing, often what, you, what you'll see is when you start mapping out all of these connections, that the diagram and the connections are, that there are many more connections than what you would actually uh, expect directly. So it is really important to have a complete overview. So over here, Gradually, you would start adding elements to create a complete overview. Like, for example, the customer data store on the on the left, and the the customer that is, that is actually using this uh, this application on the right. Um, yeah, I also mentioned up, uh, at the top. You can also see that authentication also takes place. So it's not just about retrieval of customer information. It's also about authentication towards a uh, towards a customer data store. Um, yeah oh yeah and we see that our mobile application also communicates with a third party in this case google maps and you can see that one is, is visualized as a block basically 
in this case, uh, Google Map that that's, uh, in, that indicates that in this case, Google Maps is an external entity. We don't control it. So that means that we also that that we should also take into account that as we don't control it, that we should have some sort of validation in place, right? It is something that is out of our own control. The same is true for our our customer on the top right. On the top, uh, on the on the left, I also I already indicated those two are data stores. Now, pretty much data stores can be uh, can be. It doesn't have to be a database. It can also be like a temporary data store somewhere, like a cache, or it can also be uh, a storage in memory. All that's those uh, those kinds of things. All right. So gradually, as your uh, as your image becomes more complete, you will also have to add trust boundaries and this is actually where the, tr the, the trust modeling method methodology is actually different from regular data flow diagrams because in regular data flow diagrams do not have these these trust boundaries these trust boundaries are actually where uh, where communication data flows take place between something that you well between um, environments with different levels of trust like for example here we have a trust boundary between our mobile application and our uh, and our public resources like Google Maps. Once this web application actually, of this mobile application actually queries our internal web service in our internal like DMZ environment, it also traverses two trust boundaries, right? It traverses our company trust boundary and it traverses our trust boundary with the DMZ. Internally, our um, our web service communicates again with uh, the data center environment for both the customer data store with the customer information in there and the user database. All right, all right. So you probably have asked yourself, this is quite abstract, right? You can just see things like requesting geographic information. You can see things like uh, retrieval of customer information, but it doesn't have a lot of technical details just yet. Microsoft defines four levels of um, of detail basically in threat model, uh, threat model diagrams. This one would be the first level. This would be would be the context diagram. This would be the this would diagram would have the highest level of abstraction. As soon, uh, often it can be really valuable to uh, for core components or for the entire environment to map it out in more detail, just to make sure that you can actually um, well during your threat modeling session that you can actually also talk about technical. Uh, attacks, right? And that, that's actually where the value comes in as well. So at Secura, what we usually do is we would try to make a diagram on the context level or on the level zero level, which is the level zero is uh, contains a bit more technical detail, like, for example, uh, information about the protocols that are being used, just to make sure that you can actually, during the threat modeling session, that you can actually think about technical um, technical uh, yeah well attacks as well so as an example the level zero diagram of our same environment would look something like this the the environment has been split out more you get more technical details in there for example you have our instead of our just just in our regular like customer data store you have our erp web service that is actually being queried with a oracle database in the back in the back end uh, so instead of the generic terms, you use the more technical terms. All right. I hope this still makes uh, makes some sense. <laughs> um, next to the level zero, you also have level one and level two. Usually, uh, depending on the the environment, you can also have, for example, key components while well, trap modeled in more detail. And uh, and for example, level two really focuses on. Um, all the technical details, so not not just something like okay, we're querying a web service, but no, it's about we're querying this specific web service. This is being called by this certain function in the in the code. This this authorization function is employed there, even, and Microsoft itself even uses this for uh, for uh, the kernel level. So this is really technically in depth. So identifying threats. 
So after you've mapped out this attack surface, you can start to think about and to uh, identify the threats that are applicable to this, uh, to this environment. And you can use a couple of methods for it. I've already mentioned STRIDE before. It stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And I will go through these, uh, these, these aspects of STRIDE in a, in a, in a minute. Because I can imagine that uh, it's a bit hard to, uh, to grasp directly. Um, next to that, you can use attack trees, uh, where you would actually map out uh, all the paths that an attacker could use to obtain a certain goal. So instead of focusing on the data flows, you can, uh, you're focusing on the, on the methods, and it's really useful in practice. For example, if you have environments like ICS SCADA environments that often rely on a combination of both physical security and digital security measures. So it can be really useful to use attack trees to, uh, to map out all the paths that an attacker can, uh, can use there. And next to that, there are attack libraries. And it does, this doesn't mean that you have to go out and attack all of those large buildings with books in them. But these are actually libraries that you use, like, uh, like for example, OWASP. You can use the ASVS standard, for example, where you, uh, where you would uh, use that to verify whether the vulnerabilities that are listed in there would be applicable to your system. Right? I'll give some uh, examples in the, coming, in the coming slides. Stride, spoofing, tempering, repudiation, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And I will, uh, with our example of Equifax, I'll briefly touch upon the, what you can actually think of for these, uh, these concepts. This is uh, an example of an attack tree that I, just, uh, that I just mentioned. Like, for example, if an attacker would have the, uh, would, would, would like to open a safe, would, would, uh, it would try to crack a safe. It could try to pick the lock, it could try to learn the combination, it could try to cut it open, it could try to uh, influence the way that it is actually installed. All of those options uh, in, a, in an attack tree, you would map those out. And uh, that can also be, um, well, and hopefully you would have a complete overview after that of all the methods that an attacker, of all the paths that an attacker could use to open your safe, right? And you can also use this for, uh, for digital environments. And sometimes this gives a really refreshing view of uh, the paths that an attacker could, uh, could use to, uh, to attack your system. And it doesn't, it doesn't always just have to be technical attacks like exploits or, uh, or uh, yeah, application level vulnerabilities, something like that. Attack libraries. Yeah, this is where you would use threat modeling in conjunction with um, like existing uh, knowledge bases of uh, threats, where you would think about whether these threats are applicable to you. I know that a, a lot of customers of ours use, for example, the OS top 10 of the 10 most well, dangerous uh, web application vulnerabilities that are being abused right now to uh, use that to, uh, in conjunction with threat modeling just to make sure that, that all of those uh, items that are listed in the OS the top 10 are not, are, are not present in their applications anymore. And uh, so that's also a method to use threat modeling instead of using just stride. And what's also really interesting, uh, for, especially for, uh, for red teaming, um, red teaming really focuses on whether an adversary can can like chain vulnerabilities to obtain certain crown jewels, right? How well do all these security measures and how well do they hold up against their real life adversary? And uh, the AT, ATT and CK framework of uh, MITRE uh, provides uh, information of the tactics that are actually used by attackers in real life. And this can also be very useful, for example, for, during blue team evaluations or uh, things like that to uh, use that to think about these vulnerabilities and to think about whether you actually protect against the most used tactics. So quickly, spoofing. An attacker would, uh, this, this is going back to, to Stride because Stride is the most used tactic for uh, the most used methodology for threat modeling. Spoofing, an attacker pretends to be somebody else. So what can you think of? Like for example, an attacker could try to spoof the identity of, of, of people. You can try to spoof the identity of the system administrator. You can try to spoof legitimate processes and files, legitimate systems. Like going back to the uh, Equifax example, 
um, yeah, in this case, an attacker could try to like, spoof the identity of a user with a higher level of privilege. And essentially, if you start thinking about these threats, often what you'll see is that certain threats are related to multiple parts of stride, like elevation of privilege, like an attacker tries to elevate the privileges, is often related to spoofing, like spoofing the identity of an administrator. In this case, it was actually spoofing the identity of other legitimate applications by using the credentials of those applications. So because those were stored insecurely, it allowed the attacker to spoof the identity of a different system or application. Right, I hope that makes any, any sense. Tempering, an attacker can try to change or manipulate something. Um, yeah, so for example, yeah, parameters uh, in communication streams, packets, bits on the disk, everything that an attacker actually has access to, he can try to tamper with, right? Like for example, trying to manipulate uh, parameters in HTTP, uh, the, I have the example there of the, the classical uh, SQL injection. And often this, this tampering, uh, uh, like for example, in the, in the Equifax um, example, the attacker was actually tampering with the communication to the application to exploit this vulnerability in Apache struts, right? So because this attacker has access to this application directly from the internet and the network monitoring and network uh, like prevention software doesn't really like prevent this kind of attack, it allows the attacker to tamper with this information and to obtain control over the customer portal, right? I hope that makes any sense. Repudiation. Um, this is a concept that uh, might not be used, well, might not be uh, as understandable as all the other ones, um, but this is actually, it's actually very easy. It's about actions that are not traceable to a certain system or a certain person, uh, uh, like for example, uh, in, the, in the banking, in the financial industry, it's, it's really important that actions can always be reputed back to a person. If, if you decide to send money to me, um, and uh, I expect to receive the money, but I say, hey, I didn't receive it, and you really send it to me, well, the bank is gonna have to prove that um, that, that uh, transaction is actually being successfully completed, right? And that it was actually performed by you. So examples, um, yeah. But also like on, on web vulnerabilities, things like clickjacking or cross-site scripting attacks, CSRF, um, they're all, uh, they're all related to repudiation. These are attacks to, that can be used by attackers to perform actions on behalf of other users. For example, in the, in the event of a cross-site scripting attack by placing a, uh, by abusing a vulnerability in the web application and that allows the attacker to place a bit of malicious, uh, a piece of malicious malware, malicious JavaScript inside the application that performs a certain action um, on the on the web application if this page with this malicious JavaScript is visited by another user. Um, yeah, so I think that's the best example here, repudiation, because the network monitoring wasn't really, wasn't really actively looking what was going on. It became very hard to actually figure out, well, there were actually, <laughs> they just basically lost their capacity to figure out what was going on. And that's actually related to repudiation. Actions were not traceable to this uh, to this attacker on this side. So the I of stride, information disclosure. The attacker can obtain information that is not intended for uh, for him or her. Like for example, going back to uh, to Equifax, I think the very clear example over here is the uh, obtaining of first off the configuration information, all of the uh, all of the information of uh, yeah, the configuration files for other databases, for other web applications. That's the first example. And afterwards, of course, the information from all of these, uh, these databases. Denial of service, an attacker can make the system unavailable. Yeah, I, th I think we can, uh, I think an attacker in the Equifax example could probably have made the, the system unavailable by, for example, by deleting certain information or, do, or by doing something, uh, something else. Uh, in this case, that didn't really, but I think we all know examples of denial of service attacks, right? There is a lot of denial of service attack, attacks going on in real life. Uh, a lot of uh, organizations are being attacked like, uh, like this. 
and it can be for example on a, on a process it can be to uh, to crash the system to delay it until it becomes unusable like resource starvation things like uh, that on data stores potentially attackers can keep adding information to it until it just runs out of runs out of data right and the last one elevation of privilege an attacker can obtain data or perform actions that are not intended for him or her um, I think in the Equifax example I think we've we have a couple of examples there right where uh, actually multiple vulnerabilities multiple threats are chained to elevate the privileges and what you often see in real life is that uh, a lot of threats that you may come across when you're doing threat modeling exercises internally in your organization are actually related to uh, to multiple aspects of stride um, like it can be spoofing it can be tampering and ultimately that leads to elevation of privilege like for example corrupting a certain process malicious input buffer, buffer overflows xss things like that the apache struts uh, vulnerability that was being abused to obtain access to the web server there is an example of elevation of privilege circumventing authorization controls uh, the attacker can always try to use certain management functions that are available in a application for example to try to call them as a regular user to see how, how well the authorization controls protect against these uh, these types of attacks Yeah, so in the way of working, if you actually start doing a threat modeling exercise internally, what would you do? I think it's, it's really important, and this is also the, the way of working that Microsoft suggests, just to make sure that, um, as I mentioned, that it is really important to have your, in, in the first step, to have a complete overview of your attack surface. It is also really important there to have a complete overview of the threats that are applicable to, uh, to a certain system. So. Uh, what I advise you to do is to start with a communication that traverses trust boundaries. Like, for example, over here, I think this one would be the obvious one, right? The trust boundary between Equifax on, on the one hand and the public internet on the other hand. But also the, the communication between the different zones of the internal network. You can see here, communication is traversed between, um, well, the well the the, the the portal that is more the, the chances of attack are more likely there than the internal zones um, but you can see because this system can actually reach internal systems and a lot of internal databases the impact uh, of this uh, of this attack was actually a lot bigger than it could have been so just to make sure that you keep the priority start with the communication that reverses the trust boundaries analyze the threats per element. So you would start thinking about Stride and start thinking about, okay, if an, an attacker over here on this point, can he or she potentially spoof the identity of somebody else, of a other customer, of a, uh, of a administrator? How would, that, how would that work? Are there possibilities for that? Can this customer potentially tamper with the information coming from him? I think the answer is yes there. But how do you protect against that? In this case, Equifax against tempering, um, they also they have this network monitoring and, and uh, probably like an IPS system in there, just to make sure that um, that an attacker could not really perform direct attacks on the portal like the like the uh, like like being abused in the Apache with the Apache struts vulnerability. So that wasn't working very effectively. Um, so you would. Um, work your way through the, all the elements of Stride just to make sure you are complete in this. And afterwards, uh, after you've done that for all of these elements, focusing on the communication that reverses trust boundaries, of course, you would uh, analyze all the, the, the entire diagram again for each element of Stride. And in this step, you can also combine these uh, these threats that you have already found, just to make sure that you uh, that you find potentially the threats where one plus one can potentially be a hundred together. Okay. So just some quick tips to get started in in practice. There are some resources that uh, that that we would would recommend to to use. Of course, that's the book of uh, Adam Shostak, um, Threat Modeling Designing for Security. 
um, this is, I think this is uh, like the start of the Microsoft threat modeling methodology. It would be, it's, I think it's really useful to start with this book. It is a bit, bit hard to get into because, the, because of the style of writing, but I think it's really good to, to have this. Also, Microsoft publishes a tool, the Microsoft threat modeling tool. I would recommend to use um, uh, the 2016 version of it because it automatically helps you if you define a certain communication, like for example, if you, um, if you define a communication flow that is using HTTP or HTTPS, it automatically helps you to determine which threats are applicable to it. Because for example, if you use HTTP, well, it is unencrypted, so a lot of uh, new threats are, uh, are uh, introduced there. I wouldn't, um, as a tip, I, I would use the, the threats that are coming from the tool as a guideline, but again, this is not this is not complete. I think the real value of threat modeling is in this creative process, uh, just to make sure that you have all the most important threats that are applicable to this system. The elevation of privilege game, um, yeah, that can also be a um, playful way to actually get started with uh, with threat modeling. It's a game that you can uh, that you can play with that you can play that has a, a lot of cards with threats listed on them. And basically what happens is you would, would use these cards to figure out whether the, the threat that is listed on the card applies to the system. You would start discussing them. And if you find a threat that is actually uh, applicable to the system or to the environment, you know, you could get a point for that. And the person, of course, with the most points wins the game, gets the prize. <laughs> um, OWASP also has some, some resources on it, but however, be aware that uh, it is not completely compatible with the Microsoft way of, uh, of doing threat modeling exercises. I use different, different elements as well, different uh, way of uh, drawing uh, the diagrams. So I would choose either one of those, either the Microsoft version or the OS version. And of course, uh, what you could also do is, uh, we would love to, help, to have you at uh, the threat modeling training in, uh, in October at, uh, at Secura. Well, well, this is just a very brief overview of threat modeling. But of course, I think the real value is in, well, well in, uh, in, uh, in cases that uh, to discuss and to actually learn how to do these threat modeling exercises internally and how to get the most out of them. Uh, yeah, some, some tips, and tips and tricks for doing threat modeling sessions uh, internally. I think I mentioned it a little bit before in the presentation, but make sure that the group of participants is actually diverse. And all um, and all the the competences that you require actually are actually covered in it. And often, what you see in threat modeling exercises that it becomes um, the people get enthusiastic, right? <laughs> they they get into the brainstorm mode of thinking about these uh, these threats. Uh, but it also uh, just make sure that you have all the most that you have everything covered, right? Don't deviate too much because the risk is that you start focusing on a few threats that might be applicable, but how do you know that there are not, that are no additional threats that might even be more important? So it's important to, to keep an eye on the, on the threat modeling methodology. Yes, and focus on getting the, the complete picture, especially for the, in the, in the phase where you create the, 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 the diagram. You can always scope down later. If it's outside of your project, it doesn't really matter. But if your system is uh, relying on other systems for its security, you have to make you have to you have to know about it. You have to make sure that uh, that this this reliant system is at least uh, up to the same level of security that you would expect it to be, right? That you can actually rely rely on it for the for your desired level of security, and that, and that it doesn't like introduce a lot of threats to your system, like for example in the Equifax case. Yes, and don't spend too much time on specific attacks. It can be, it can be really interesting to start completely mapping out a certain attack, but again, keep an eye on the time and don't deviate too much from the from the methodology. Yes, and what's also really important, especially it might it might seem like an, a very simple point, right? Documentation during the session. However, in practice, it always uh, you, you see a lot that uh, as, as companies start with threat modeling exercises, that they forget this step, that they're all enthusiastic about all the, the threats that I that I found, but two weeks later, they're like, oh, which threats did we find again? So it is, um, it is important to keep 
to keep an eye on, uh, on this and to document all of these threats during the session. And to summarize the results at the end of the meeting, just to make sure that everybody is in, in sync. So to conclude, I think threat modeling is, a, is, an, is an easy and effective way to, uh, improve your, uh, to improve your security, basically. Um, and I think it's also, because you have this complete overview, it becomes very, uh, for, it's a very easy way to increase the level of control uh, that you have over the threats. At least you're gonna have a complete overview of the threats that are applicable. And using that, you can increase your security maturity level. And it's, uh, I think it's a really valuable tool to get insight into first your attack surface. And what often happens during threat modeling sessions is that a lot of questions come out of these questions, of, of these sessions. Some, sometimes you just don't know whether a threat is, a, is applicable. If you've just uh, created a web application, you might not be completely certain whether this web application is vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. Yeah, you just don't know until you investigate, right? But that, if that's a, a crucial point in your uh, security of your entire system, and a lot of other like internal controls rely on that, that might uh, give uh, be an additional reason to focus on that term in, in for example, a, an additional security assessment of the technical web application. And what I really like about threat modeling as well is resource efficiency. Using threat modeling, because you have this complete, complete overview of your attack surface and the threats that are applicable to it, uh, you can use this to, uh, to focus your effort and resources where, you can actually, where it matters the most. I hope that makes any, any sense, but often what I see in practice is that organizations have a certain focus on, they know about certain threats to their environment, and they really start focusing all of their efforts on that. They start implementing a lot of expensive products. They start hiring a lot of expensive uh, consultants to, to assess these, uh, these threats. But however, how do you know that that is actually the most relevant threat? Maybe there's like a, a, a maybe there's, uh, there's an, another connection, a third party that connects to your system. Maybe there's another entry point somewhere that you might not be aware of, but can be the weak point in this, uh, in this environment. So hereby, I would like to uh, yeah to thank you all for uh, for for the attention for the attention and, and listening. Uh, so if you have any additional questions or suggestions, I would love to hear your uh, I would love to hear them now. You can just write them in the in the chat, and uh, we can uh, we can discuss. Okay, yeah, it looks like there are no additional questions. Okay, well um, well again hereby I would like to thank you all for uh, for listening. I hope it has been uh, I hope it has been relevant for uh, for you and if you have any additional questions or after the session just uh, yeah you can always uh, contact us for that thank you very much and have a nice day <laughs>